you are Kuros, the greatest warrior of all. Since defeating the evil wizard Malkil, your renown has spread far and wide. Today you've been summoned to the land of Sindarin, a once great kingdom where Malkil has taken the shape of four evil elementals. Wind, water, fire, earth. Each infernal elemental must first be vanquished in his own domain before the final conflict. To succeed, assemble the four pieces of the Shattered Iron Sword and seek help from the four animal kings. This will be your toughest challenge yet, and it's only just begun. So begins your quest in Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2, one of the most impressive sequels for the NES. Much like the original, you'll explore large levels filled with hidden treasures and secret rooms, you'll find new equipment or magic spells, and you'll battle challenging bosses. This time, however, the difficulty has been cranked up, and instead of the infinite continues you had in the first game, in Iron Sword, you only get two. After the success of the first Wizards and Warriors, Rare wanted to make a sequel, but they were just too busy to make it themselves. Based in the UK, Rare was one of the most prolific developers of NES games, and they brought us hits like Snake, Rattle, and Roll, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and of course, Battletoads. They contracted a relatively new company called Zippo Games to make the Wizards and Warriors sequel. Rare's Tim Stamper was still involved in the production, and the music was still composed by David Wise, but this time the bulk of the development would be handed off to a pair of brothers, Stee and John Pickford. When the Pickford brothers and programmer Steve Hughes formed Zippo Games in 1987, they primarily wanted to work on games for cutting-edge 16-bit computer systems, but they took this job from Rare to pay the bills. It may sound like a bad idea to have an unproven studio make such a high-profile sequel, but the team at Zippo was stacked with future All-Stars. I actually spoke with Steve Pickford, and he told me that while everyone chipped in, his brother John was the lead designer on Ironsword, although he isn't listed in the game's credits. Stee was the game's main artist, and Stephen Hughes coded the game. The final product features many upgrades to the original, and the large screen-filling boss enemies were very impressive back in 1989. The original Wizards and Warriors got a lot of praise from critics, but it did get one major complaint. People thought the game was just too easy. In hindsight, an easier game may have been appealing to a lot of players, but Rare seemed to take this criticism to heart because they started making some of the most challenging games of all time, and Iron Sword is no exception. Play carefully and you can survive, but be prepared for a real test of your skills. The good news is that the treasure you find can be used to purchase better equipment this time, or even more lives. Iron Sword was a massive success for Rare when it released in 1989, selling over half a million copies. Acclaim handled the marketing for the game, and it was their decision to put Italian supermodel Fabio on the cover. It may look ridiculous, but it's easily one of the most memorable and iconic pieces of NES box art, and may have caused more than one well-meaning mother to buy it for her kids. The success of Iron Sword led to Zippo working exclusively with Rare, during which time they developed the cult classic Solar Jetman, and eventually Rare bought the company and turned it into their Manchester studio. The Pickford brothers left Zippo Games shortly after they were acquired by Rare, but they continued to work in the industry for years and would go on to make Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage and Plot for the Super Nintendo. Rare only released one more Wizards and Warriors game for the NES, Kuros Visions of Power, which was met with mixed reviews and didn't sell as well as the first two games in the series. The open world here is very ambitious for an NES game, 
but it's certainly disappointing that they didn't include a password feature this time. With Rare working on games like Donkey Kong Country and Killer Instinct in the 16-bit era, we never got to see what Kuros could have done on the Super Nintendo. Modern critics still appreciate the elemental excitement found in Kuros' second adventure. When IGN released their list of the top 100 NES games of all time, they ranked Iron Sword at number 64. Modern players that attempt this game will still have to deal with all of the challenges the NES is notorious for. Enemies can deal massive damage and obliterate you in seconds. You may think you're safe if you still have your continues left, but once you reach the Earth stage, the game stops accepting them. If you run out of lives, it's game over. But what if I showed you a secret way to rig the money-making game so that you win every time? What if I showed you a secret trick that will not only let you keep your sword magic after defeating a boss, but will let you quickly skip ahead in the game? And what if I showed you how to defeat every boss? Even the evil wizard Malkil's final form? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. Let's get started. All right, Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2. This is a very difficult game, so if you're having trouble, try holding up on controller 1 and controller 2 as you begin the game. You'll have 255 continues instead of the normal 2. Yeah, that's so many lives it might take hours to lose that many. But don't think that you're getting away with anything here. Whenever you reach the Earth stage, the game stops accepting continues regardless of whether or not you entered a code at the beginning of the game, so you're going to need something else to get you through that part. You do have access to a password system in this game, and that's another way we can get extra lives. If you press the select button, you can write down your password, and if you had fewer than two lives left in reserve whenever you got the password, try changing the fifth character to the letter N. That should give you a full two lives in reserve. Now that's the most lives you can get using a password. I have found that occasionally this one doesn't give you the full two lives. In that case, just try it again, but use the letter J instead of N. That should fix the problem. And you can see there now we have the full two lives. Unfortunately, the password doesn't record how much money you have, but if you need help with money, hold up, B, and select as you press start on the title screen. Then you need to collect at least 100 money so you can play the money game and go to the inn. You can do this at any inn in the game, and you can use a password and still make this trick work. The skull will fall into the first cup, then the fourth, then the third, then the second, and the first one again. And it will just keep following that pattern. After the first cup, all you need to do is just keep moving one space to the left. It is very easy to remember. You can rack up so much money using this trick, and you can even do it in the earth stage where you can buy extra lives. So that's a good way to get a bunch of lives to get through the end of the game. If you leave the store, you will be able to pick this up right where it left off, so remember which cup the skull landed in the last time you played, or you can just play once and see where it lands and pick it up from there. With those secret codes out of the way, let's jump into the actual game. As we begin the game in the Eagle's Cliffs, grab the key on the left side of the mountain, 
and then make your way to the door in the lower right corner. Once you're inside, you'll want to grab this large diamond which is worth 250 money and be very careful to avoid these small demons. They may not look very imposing, but they can deal you massive damage and possibly even kill you. We needed that key to open the treasure chest, and inside we'll find this sword. It's a little bit bigger than the dagger we had before, and if we jump over into this corner, we'll enter a secret room where we'll find four big diamonds for a thousand gold pieces. At the top of this small red shaft, we're going to find two more keys, and we're going to need those to open some chests. Once again, you need to be careful of these enemies. The way the damage works in this game is that you're only safe on your boots and your weapon. The rest of your body is vulnerable. Carefully make your way over to the treasure chest once you get through the door. Inside, we're going to find something pretty good. The familiar spell. You can use that from the select menu, and it will kill the enemies in the area, and also grab you any items that are nearby. Up here in the secret room, we'll find some coins. Those are worth 50 money each, so don't forget to pick them up, and we'll also find an extra key. Speaking of keys, if we head over here to the top left corner, we'll find the eagle who wants a golden egg, but right below there's a key, and if we already had the golden egg, we would not be able to pick up that key. So make sure to grab it early so that we can open this chest and get some treasure. And now that we have a bunch of money, let's visit the inn and see what we have to buy. Keys are out of control expensive here, but food is very reasonable. And we can also buy a new spell, the Veil of Slumber, which I do recommend you pick up. Before we use it though, let's head over to the left side of the mountain and if we take a little hop off this platform underneath the treasure, we'll find a hidden room with just a ton of big diamonds in it. Do not miss this one. Once you have all the diamonds, make your way back to the bottom and exit through the door. And now let's try out that Veil of Slumber spell. That's going to slow down a lot of enemies, and while it doesn't work on all the enemy types in the game, it definitely works on these birds here in the cliffs. You want to grab that food and then do a very quick walk off the right of that platform and you should be able to reach the golden egg. Now, if you miss the golden egg, you could also use the familiar spell. You may think the familiar spell wouldn't pick up important items like the golden egg, but it totally will. You only get three charges of it though, so you could actually make this very difficult jump if you don't want to waste your familiar spell, but you probably won't need it later in the game, so if you want to use your familiar spell now, go for it. I highly recommend that you use either it or the Veil of Slumber as you climb the cliffs and make your way to the upper left corner where we can meet with the eagle who will take our golden egg and carry us up into the clouds. Feel free to write down your password when we get to the next area, but be warned, if you use the password, you'll lose all of your money, so I actually recommend we try to beat this first chunk of the game in one sitting. Even if you lose a few lives, it's better to make it to the next inn with all of our money so that we can buy the best weapon in the game. Once you get to the clouds, head over to the left and grab that food to restore a little bit of health. And then there's a secret room in this cloud right above that has a ton of diamonds in it, so you won't want to miss this one. Once you have them all, exit back out to the left, and then we're going to head across to the right. If you still have charges of your Veil of Slumber spell, now is a good time to use it, but it won't slow down the tornado enemies. We already have three keys, and we're only going to need two of them, but if you do need to find a key here in the clouds, there is one over on the far right side, underneath this cloudy embankment. Once you have it, you'll note that the boss is in the upper right corner, and we're not ready to fight him just yet, but over here on the right side we can find some food, and there's even more in a hidden room located right below. Inside we'll find that chicken, which will restore 16 points of health, and we can also trigger some magic to appear. We're going to need magic to be able to fight the boss of this area, although we don't have the spell that we need to use the magic with yet. There's another set of magic over here on the left as well as a key. 
Once you have that key, you want to bounce up here into this door, and in this room we'll find the first of those two treasure chests that we were looking for. This one contains a helmet. The helmet will protect you from coming into contact with enemies. Helmets and shields don't protect you from projectiles, but it will reduce any damage that you take from contact with an enemy by two, so it is important to pick that up. Once you have it, we're going to head out the door on the left side and carefully make our way across the top of the clouds into this door in the far left corner. This room is a tricky one. You'll want to get bouncing on the clouds and try to carefully make your way underneath those demons. You don't want to come into contact with them. They can deal you a lot of damage. Try to move a little bit to the right and then to the left so that you have some momentum to get over those cloudy pillars. And in the far left of this room, we will find a critical item, the Wind Bane. The Wind Bane will allow us to fire shots from our weapon, and that's going to make it a lot easier to defeat these demons, although it does use up our magic power. These shots are going to be required to defeat the boss in this area, but they can also be used to pick up items like that 1-Up. Make sure to collect the 1-Up before entering this hidden room. Whenever you exit this hidden room, it'll drop you down to a lower platform, and it'll take a lot of hopping to get back up to where the 1-Up is. So whenever you leave this one, you want to hold to the left, and then you should be able to jump up and grab that food, then make your way over to the right, where if we shoot in just the right spot, we can trigger some more magic to appear, which should max us out. Very good. Now that we have maximum magic, we're going to make our way to the lower right corner where we can find an optional item inside a hidden room. This is the Book of Sindarin, and it's one of the four Sindarin relics. These relics are all optional items, but they are worth a ton of points, and they will appear on your display at the bottom of the screen, so we want them for completeness sake. Watch out for these skull and crossbones enemies. Your wind bane can be used to defeat them, and up here there's a hidden room with some food in it, so you don't want to miss this. That's a good place to refuel just a bit. However, when you exit this room, those skull and crossbones guys are going to be back, so be prepared for that. And the Book of Sindarin we're looking for is in the lower left corner. With the book in hand, the only thing left to do up here in the clouds is take out the wind elemental. So that's what we're going to do next. Carefully make your way across the bottom of the hidden room, and then head to the middle of the cloudy area where we'll begin our ascent. There's a nice place to climb right here, so just keep bouncing up the clouds and we're going to head over towards where secret room C was, and just bounce up above it. Go onto this small cloud here, and you should be able to bounce right from this platform into the door where we'll face the boss. This guy isn't too tough, you just want to get about this distance from the elemental and start attacking with your wind bane. If you get overwhelmed, hold up to shoot a defensive shot, but it won't be long before the wind elemental is defeated. And here is a good trick, if you stand in the doorway, jump and use your wind bane to collect the piece of the iron sword, you'll be able to keep all of your keys, all of your magic points, and the wind bane for the next area. So now that we're in the next area, you need to be careful also that you don't lose all of your magic points. If you run out completely, you will lose the Wind Bane, but you can actually use it to pick up the Golden Fly, which will make this forest area super easy to finish. You can now go right past the Frog, and not only can you use it to collect the Golden Fly and easily clear that section, but your Wind Bane will work on the Water Elemental in the next area. All you need to do is head over here to the right and we'll find some magic. You probably won't need it, but there's even more magic over there. And then just make your way all the way over to the far right where we'll meet the Water Elemental. And if you stand on this platform up here, this one, you can just keep firing the Wind Bane and very quickly defeat this boss. Now I'm going to show you the normal way to beat this area, but this is a very fast way to get through the game, although it is possible that you might lose a life as you go up above. You can even keep the Wind Bane into the next area by doing the same trick, 
And here in the fire zone, there is another item you can collect with it, the golden crown, which can be very quickly collected using the same trick. So that is a very, very powerful trick that you can use, but let's just assume that we didn't do that, and I'll now show you how we would normally approach the forest level. You'll notice very quickly when you go through the normal way that the game takes all of your magic points and all of your keys away, but they don't refill your life points, so you should spend a few moments here in the forest level trying to pick up a bunch of this food and get your life up to a better level before entering this passage in the top tree. You'll want to make your way to the bottom here, and don't worry too much if you miss some gems because we are going to have to climb up again. But the main attraction here is a 1-up and a key at the bottom, both of which are going to be pretty handy as we move forward. Once you have them both, climb back out the top. You cannot exit through the bottom. And we'll be able to emerge from the top door and make our way down to the left. If you just kind of hold to the left for a bit, you should land on that platform. And then you can bounce up here, where we'll find another secret room. And this one contains a lot of food so you'll probably want to hit this one up kind of early. Once you have all this food, there are a few coins and gems down at the bottom, so you won't want to miss those. And once we exit this room, the next thing that we're going to do is find the inn here in the forest, where we can buy the game's best weapon, the Diamond Sword. Do not open that treasure chest yet. Avoid it, and go to this door in the tree up here, where we can buy that diamond sword. All weapons deal the same amount of damage in Iron Sword, so size is what matters. It has nothing to do with the motion of the ocean. The only way that you take damage in this game is if you get hit in the head, or in the knees, or the back. And you could get hit in the chest, but a very large and thick sword will protect you from that. So that's why the Diamond Sword is the best. It's the biggest. It's arguably better than the Iron Sword that we'll get at the end of the game, but we will need that. In this treasure chest we can find a shield, which will add 2 to our defense, and so it reduces any damage from when we contact an enemy by 2. In here we'll find a secret room with 2 keys in it, and you need to pay careful attention to where the entrance to this secret room is because we are going to need to avoid it later. So make sure you notice where it is. It's right near the trunk of that tree. The reason why this matters is we're about to go and get the Water Spout spell, which we're going to use to get the Golden Fly so that we can get past the frog and into the water area. But if you enter any doors, you will lose the Water Spout spell, and you will have to use another key to get it again. I don't think this is a bug, I think the programmers didn't want you to be able to use the water spout spell in any other areas in the game, but you need to be super careful to avoid that hidden room which is right down there. As you come up to this spot where you'll want to use the water spout spell, and it will deliver you to the top right corner of the map where we'll find the golden fly. If you do mess it up and enter a door, it's not a total disaster. To fix the problem, you just want to buy an extra key at the end. Once you have the golden fly, you remember where the frog is. That's right, he's down here in the bottom of this tree. And once you see him with the golden fly, he'll allow you to go down here. And there's a very missable secret room right up here, so be careful not to drop down too quickly. You want to pop in here because there's an extra life and 250 money hidden inside. Once you have it, you can slide down to the bottom, where we'll find another treasure chest. This one just contains more money, but certainly we do want that. There's going to be more things that we'll need to purchase later. So make sure to grab that treasure, and then exit through the door at the bottom. We know that the boss is over on the right side here, but we're not ready for that yet, so you want to head to the left first. That tankard item will restore a very small amount of health, and you don't want to miss that key. We're going to need it below. Over here in this corner, we'll find another hidden room that has another one of those optional Sindarin items. This one is very difficult to collect, so you may want to avoid it if you're not going for full completeness. 
Once you get past the first set of enemies, you can quickly run under the second set, and you'll definitely want to do that because these guys are super dangerous. If one of them drops directly on your head, it may kill you in a single hit. The only way to get past these is to very aggressively run under them as soon as you have enough room and try to trigger the next one right away. If you don't trigger the next one quickly enough, you'll still be standing underneath that one when it drops. And we made it. You may just want to avoid the Cross of Sindarin, but that's how you get it. If you do die in there, you'll have a bit of invincibility when you come back to life. Use that to your advantage and quickly collect the cross and leave. Down here we can find some more magic, and we'll be able to easily fill our magic up here in the water cave. There's a hidden room over here that has two magics. Make sure that you collect all of the eggs and let those 500s go off the screen before triggering the next one, or you may not get all of the eggs from it. Once you've collected them all, we should have max magic, and now we should just collect the spell that we'll need to use with it. We can find that down here on the left. There's actually a spot where you can walk through the wall. Inside the treasure chest, we'll find the Blight Water. Of all the elemental magics in the game, the Blight Water is my favorite one. You can shoot it in multiple directions, which is pretty awesome. We don't want to waste it just yet since there's no enemies around here, but make sure to grab that key, and then you're going to head up this way, where we'll make a nice small hop jump to get through that small passage. Head up here, and in the upper left corner here, we'll find another hidden room. Right there. This one just has a few coins in it, and the coins disappear quickly, so you'll probably want to collect them using your Blight Water. Make sure to just jump to collect the one above you. Trying to shoot upwards will probably miss. But shoot to the left, the right, upper left, and upper right, and then jump, and you should be able to collect two sets of five coins. Once you have those coins, we're going to find something even more important, though. You can just run off of that platform to get down to where this chest is, and inside we'll find the Silver Fleece spell, which can grant us temporary invincibility. You get three charges of the Silver Fleece spell, and there will be a store later that sells it, but I recommend saving it for the final boss. We're now all ready to fight the Water Elemental, although there's a few more gems up here, and if you need to refill your magic, well, there's quite a few magic pods. You may recall where they are from when we were doing that glitch route. So grab as much magic as you need, and then make your way back to the far right where we'll meet up with the water elemental. And this time, now that we have the blight water, he's going to be very easy to defeat. Just stay right down here in this spot and shoot up and to the right. If you stay right here and just keep shooting, you'll take very minimal damage and you need to be careful that the current will kind of push you to the left, so you'll need to move back to the right occasionally. But you'll notice that you can use the same trick with the Blight Water that we did with the Wind Bane, and so you can actually keep that weapon here into the fire stage. If you're going to save any of your boss magics, the Water one is probably the best. I really like to use it on these cave demons here in the volcano area, and I want to show you a few things you can do with it. But first, a warning. There's a hidden room here that contains a key, and right after you get that key, there's a treasure chest. But it's a trap. That's right, Admiral Akbar. Inside, there's a sword, which is probably longer than the one you started the game with, but it's much worse than the diamond sword, so if you already had it, you absolutely want to avoid that chest. But since we're using that glitch, I want to point out that you can use it to collect some of these gems and other items that are in this area, and normally would be inaccessible. And also, if you head over here, you can collect the Golden Crown, which will allow you to move on to the next part. If you don't take advantage of that glitch and keep your Blight Water, this green vertical shaft at the beginning of the Fire Zone will be a bit more difficult. Remember, when you're fighting these cave demon enemies, 
any projectile in the game that hits you from the front will deal you 16 damage, which is about the same as one food, but if it hits you from behind, you'll take 32. If you come in contact with the enemy itself, well that's when you can take massive damage and get hit multiple times, so that's what you primarily want to avoid. You may even want to skip the key in that hidden room if you have the diamond sword because you'll carefully need to get past that treasure chest without collecting it. If you do skip collecting the key, you can simply purchase one right here at the inn for only 700 money, so it may be worth it. You can also buy the silver fleece there if you used up some of your charges. That's the only store in the game that sells it, and you'll want three full charges for the final boss. Over here, we can open up a chest and grab a helmet upgrade. This is the game's second best helmet and reduces all damage from contacting enemies by four. Over here, we'll grab another key, and as we head down to the right, if we get a bit of momentum, we should be able to jump up to where this extra life is. And there's also some magic there, so you'll want to grab it. And if you slide down in this blue room, there's a few gems at the bottom, but you won't be able to collect any of the gems on the side unless you took advantage of the glitch to keep the blight water. In the middle of the base of the volcano, we'll find another treasure chest, and this one contains the Fleetfoot spell. This spell will make us run faster and jump higher, and it's not one that we're going to be able to carry into other areas, so we should just use it right away. We want to jump up here and we'll find another hidden room. This one contains a few of those tankard items which will restore a very small amount of health. But at the top, there's a much more useful item, a 1-up. So make your way to the top of this blue room, and there it is. Grab that 1-up and then drop down to the bottom. The next thing that we need to do is collect the golden crown. So we want to continue jumping up the volcano. This is the room where we can do it, and as soon as you enter, cast your fleet foot spell again and hold to the right as you drop down. You'll be able to grab the golden crown at the bottom. Of course you won't be able to grab any of the food in here unless you have used the blight water. And outside, watch out for that salamander that'll try to spit fire at you. But now that we have the golden crown, we can head to the end, but there's a hidden room in this purple corridor that we can grab a lot of gems inside. So just head up into there, and once you have all those gems, you can stop back at the inn if you need to restore some of your health. It's very possible that you'll take a lot of damage from the fire here on the side of the volcano, so feel free to spend a little bit of money restoring health. And then it's time to begin our ascent. You want to jump over here on the right side, use the fleet foot spell, you might as well, there's no reason to save it. If you enter this room, just exit it. You don't want to be in there, because this is the room that we're looking for. Once you talk to the dragon, he'll stop spitting fire out of the top of the volcano. He was the one making the volcano active, and we'll be able to jump up on top and drop down into the fire cavern. Well, it looks like we lost our first life, but that's not that big of a deal here in the fire cavern, because we won't be able to continue after we leave this area, so if we ever drop below two lives, we could just intentionally die and use a continue to replenish some lives and not really lose anything. Over here on the far right side, we'll grab our first key, and if we drop down carefully onto the left, we'll find a hidden room that contains another key, and if you're feeling daring, it also contains the optional Gauntlet of Sindarin. This is one of the easier Sindarin artifacts to get, so feel free to grab that one, and there's also some food on the sides. You can kind of bounce off those skull and crossbones if you're careful. There's another hidden room in the top right corner, and this one contains an extra life, so if you were considering burning a few lives here so that you could use a continue, you may want to do that and then come up here and collect the extra life, so now you'll have three lives moving forward, which could be very good entering the very difficult earth area. You do have to contend with some of those cave demons again. This kind will 
pelt you with projectiles, which is still better than hitting the cave demon themselves. Once you have that extra life, make your way up here where we're going to find the important magic here in the fire cavern. It's through this door. Inside the chest we'll find the fire smite, and even if you kept your magic from the previous areas, you must have the fire smite to defeat this boss. So no matter which glitches you've been taking advantage of, you must collect this item. It's also pretty handy for taking out those skull and crossbones, and you'll need to use a little hop jump to get across at the end. Try not to use too many of your fire smites on the general enemies. You want to save most of your magic for the boss here, but if you need to burn a toothy creeper, you gotta burn a toothy creeper. Sometimes you just gotta creep. Yeah, just keep it all on the down low. And up here we can grab a treasure chest that we had to skip before because we didn't have keys when we first started. So we'll want to grab that money, and then we can make our way to the lower left corner. The game's second best weapon, the axe, is located here in the fire cavern, but if you already have the diamond sword, you'll still want to avoid this one. So if you have the diamond sword, just stay away from that treasure chest, and instead you want to jump on this platform that's almost right above it, that's where you'll be able to get a bunch of magic, and that should be enough to fight the boss. Head over here, and here is the boss, the Fire Elemental. The Fire Elemental was very frustrating for me when I was a kid because a lot of my shots would miss, but I found a foolproof way to always hit this guy. What you want to do is stand on the left side of this left platform, and whenever you see the mouth over on the right side of the screen, so far over to the right that like the right eye is off screen, that's when you want to launch a fire smite. If you do that, every shot will be a hit, and remember, this is the last time you can use a continue, so if you have fewer than two lives and any continues left, make sure to use one and get back to two lives before you come down here. Now if you want to save the fire smite, you can still use that glitch here, and you'll be able to take it with you into the earth level. But we're not going to dwell on that for very long, you've certainly seen this trick before. The earth level is the last of the four, and it's also the most difficult. There are a lot of difficult enemies and challenging jumps here in the upper pit. Use a small tap jump to get across there, and then you can go up through the ceiling to collect some big diamonds, and when you try to collect that coin, it will split into five coins, which you have to collect quickly or they'll disappear. Be very careful of those stone pillar golems, which will pelt you with projectiles, and if you just run off to the left there, you can come into this area and stand on that platform in the far left of it to raise the golden tankard out of the ground and then collect it. Now that we have the golden item, there's a difficult jump coming up. Run to the right here, and don't stop on that small platform. Just keep moving. Jump and then jump again, and you should be able to get across there. That's a tough one. Up here you want to avoid that treasure chest, and it looks like we lost a life, but that's alright, we have a decent number of them. And over here in the upper left corner, we'll find the famous inn that sells more extra lives. If you have money, you probably want to spend most of it on extra lives here, but try to save at least a thousand gold. We're going to need 6200 in the next area. Well, I said you don't want to collect this sword, and if you had the axe or the diamond sword, you should certainly avoid it. Instead, we're going to head down below, where we can avoid this ghost, and head towards a secret room. It's right over here. This secret room has a ton of cash in it, so you may actually want to run back and buy another extra life after you visit this one. But be warned, your password will only return you with two lives in reserve at the most, so if you have a bunch of lives right now, you're going to want to try to carry those to Ice Fire Mountain. Over here, you want to avoid that food. The extra big chickens are actually poison food and will deal you a ton of damage. 
But do not miss this treasure chest that contains the Dragon Tooth spell. The Dragon Tooth spell can turn enemies into food, and it's actually going to be very important for our endgame strategy. Don't miss that one. If you just keep making your way to the left, you'll go on to the lower pit, but you probably won't want to skip all the goodies up here. First, there's a hidden room that contains about a thousand money, if you can collect all five of those coins before they disappear. The main attraction are the three big diamonds at the top. So make sure to grab those, and then once you exit this secret room, you'll find an extra life over on the right side, but that's not all. Behind that extra life is another hidden room, and this one is very interesting. There's some of those dangerous enemies that will try to drop on top of you and smash you, but if you can get by them, there's not only a ton of money in here, but over here we can find another hidden room, and this one contains a bunch of food which can help with our health, as well as a thousand more money. So you'll probably want to collect that, and then up at the top there's another one of those optional Sindarin items, this is the last one, the Ring of Sindarin. In the rest of the game, all of the Sindarin items have been in the second section of each elemental realm, but this one's in the first. You'll need to use a very little tap jump to get up there. If you mess up the jump, you'll probably hit one of these enemies and you might take a bunch of damage. Oof. That guy landed on me so you can see how bad it could be. It actually could be worse than that. Sometimes you'll take double hits, which is like a one-hit death. Carefully make your way back out of the secret room. And that's the only other thing that we wanted to collect here. So now we can head back to the left, where we can grab another tankard and enter this doorway, where we'll duck under some skeleton spiders and meet up with the bear. The golden tankard that we found at the beginning of the earth area is our key to moving on here. Make sure to avoid that poison food and head over here to the right side, where surprisingly, we'll find an inn behind this treasure chest. Yeah, you don't usually see an inn in the second part of an elemental realm, and this one contains a very helpful item, the diamond helmet. It's the best helmet in the game, and in addition to the diamond helmet, you'll want to try to buy 8 keys if you have enough money. If you're a little bit short, you'll miss out on some of the treasure, or you can probably skip the Veil of Slumber, which we're going to find over on the left side. The Veil of Slumber isn't super useful here in the late game, but we will be able to use it to do a fun trick at the very end. We might as well use our familiar spell now that we're getting so close to the end of the game. And over here on the right side, we will find another treasure chest and this one contains the most important item in this area, the Earth Scorch. The Earth Scorch is that magic that we were looking for and we'll need it to defeat the boss, although we don't have any magic power right at the moment. Inside this secret room we'll find a few coins, so feel free to grab those, and once you have them, make your way back out the same door. That's only the first secret room in this area, and there's a lot more money to be found. Over here we'll find a treasure chest that's pretty hard to avoid if you have keys, so it's very important that you get the Earth Scorch first if you didn't have enough money to buy a lot of keys here. There's another hidden room over here in this corner, and you'll need to use a small tap jump to get out of here with a little bit of momentum behind it. It can be frustrating to jump out of some of these corners. Head over here to the left. Inside this chest is some more treasure. So we'll want to grab that. And up above here we'll find another hidden room, in addition to a large diamond. This hidden room is one of the most important ones. Not only does it contain an extra life, but it also contains a big charge up for our magic, and that should give us enough to beat the boss. You don't want to waste very much Earth Scorch, but at least we can use it now. Be very cautious of those red Earth Demons. Those are pretty dangerous, but don't miss the shield down here. This is the game's second best shield, and the best one we won't be able to get until the very end, so you'll definitely want to pick that up. 
there's some treasure in this chest. And we're almost to the end of the lower pit at this point. Once again, you'll have to carefully jump out of this corner. You may need to fight some enemies so that you can get through. And you see what I mean, sometimes you just slide back down, but get a little momentum behind you and just do a small tap jump, and you should be fine. Drop down here, and that's the final chest of the area, which just contains more treasure. And through the door is the boss, the Earth Elemental. There's an easy way, and there's a hard way of fighting the Earth Elemental. The more challenging way is to just go right up in front of it, and try to lob the Earth Scorch into the mouth. You'll definitely take some damage doing this, but you will be able to kill the Earth Elemental pretty quickly, and you probably won't lose that many lives. However, we are at the end of the game here, and every life is critical, so you may want to take the easier path. Before I show you that, I do want to point out that if you use the Earth Scorch to pick up the last piece of the Iron Sword, you will be able to keep your magic moving into the next area, so that'll give you some extra shots of the Iron Sword, but you won't keep the Earth Scorch weapon itself. Now here's the easy way to defeat the Earth Elemental. Just go forward and touch the mouth, then run back towards the door, and get to this position right on top of the third small stone in the floor. You'll be able to attack the boss from here, and almost nothing it shoots will be able to reach you. A very easy way to defeat the Earth Elemental. And that's it. With the Earth Elemental defeated, we have assembled the Iron Sword, and it's time to move on to the final stage. Ice Fire Mountain. This long, tall, vertical shaft leads to the base of the mountain, and also leads to the game's final inn, where we can purchase the best shield, the Diamond Shield, for 5200 gold. So if you're a little bit short on money, you'll want to collect as much as you can while you're in here. Once you exit that first secret room, keep making your way up to the top, the stones that fall down here are not that difficult to avoid, and you're going to want to conserve as many lives as you can. There aren't very many chests here in Ice Fire Mountain, but this one contains a pretty handy item, the Asp's Tongue Spell. This is a very weird one, but essentially what it lets you do is refill your health entirely whenever you go to an inn. It's something that we really wish we would have had earlier continue to climb up here, and not too far after that chest is where we'll find the second hidden room over here on the right side. And this one contains quite a bit of money, so you don't want to miss that. Grab as much cash as you can, and then continue to make the climb. We're almost to the top now. Watch out for the rocks. Just keep jumping, and this is really not that difficult. We'll be at the base of the mountain in no time. And here it is, Ice Fire Mountain. As we emerge at the base of the mountain, we'll see the door to the inn right above us, but we'll have to jump to it from the left side. Let's try out that new magic. Normally the innkeeper would be selling these chickens for 600 gold apiece, but whenever we use the asp's tongue, he'll feel very compelled to just throw them at us. It should be pretty easy to collect enough to max out your health, but it's fun to see how many you can grab. I usually like to stay over on the left side, and once he's done throwing them at you, you should also purchase the diamond shield for 5200 and one key. The diamond shield is the game's best shield, and you will be able to find a key out here on the mountain, but it's very hard to get to, so it's much more convenient to purchase one key at the store. You want to make your way all the way over to the left, where we're going to find the chest that we need to use the key on. It's down here at the very bottom. Once you get down to the bottom, you'll cut across to the right, and here it is. This chest contains the Seven League Boots. The Seven League Boots will make us jump much higher, and that's how we're going to be able to climb Ice Fire Mountain. So once you have them, you want to climb up the right side of the mountain, that's the easiest way to go, then jump up to this part, and cut across to the left. 
There's one more hidden room up here, so if you want to go to it, it's in the upper left corner. It really just contains some more money, so it's not super important, but hey, you know, it's another extra hidden room. You might want to check it out. Hop up here, and if you did need a key or two, there are two up here, but we'll need the seven league boots to get up here, so you won't be able to use them to unlock that treasure chest. However, there is one more chest in the game. It just contains treasure, so it's just more money that we won't be able to use, but if you want a key for that, that's a good place to find one. You'll have to drop down here as you jump back to the right, but you can jump right back up and then head over to the top right corner where we'll find a door that will lead through to a passage, and this passage will take us to the mountain summit. Once we get out of here, we'll be at the summit and it'll be time to fight the final bosses so you want to do your best to try not to lose any lives in here. If you have some spells like the Familiar Spell or the Veil of Slumber, use that stuff now, but save the Dragon Tooth spell unless you are super desperate. Over here on the left, we're going to be able to find the game's last hidden room after we get this food. And it's over here on the left side. You'll find a small divot in the ceiling. That's where it is. And inside, there's another treasure chest. The last one in the game. We don't really need this money for anything, but it's nice to collect it anyway. Once we have it, we'll leave the final secret room and make our way to the left. Continue to use spells like Veil of Slumber or the Familiar if you have it and just continue your climb. There's a bit of magic over here on the left, don't miss that. And if you get really desperate, you may want to use one charge of your Dragon Tooth spell, but only use it if you're going to die. I do not recommend using more than one charge, you're probably going to need two to be able to do the trick here. This is it, the summit of Icefire Mountain, and the most difficult part of the entire game. Head over here to the lower right corner where we'll find some magic, and then we're going to head back to the left. If you have three charges of the Silver Fleece, several charges of the Dragon Tooth spell, and at least a few lives, then I have very high confidence you can beat this game. Once your magic is fully maxed out, we need to max out our health. You want to come down here and let these snow golems fire at you, and you want to do it so that there's a lot of projectiles on the screen. When you see there's a whole bunch, that's when you want to use the Dragon Tooth, which will turn it all into food. You need to collect that food quickly though because it will disappear, and you want to max out your health. It's very important that you reach max health once you had max magic. If you do that, Whenever your magic runs out, it will automatically refill, and this is going to be huge when we're fighting the final bosses. Once you're ready, come up the middle peak, and I like to fight the Earth Elemental by itself. It usually just circles around you in a clockwise pattern, and you can fire the Iron Sword in multiple directions, much like the Blight Water and you just want to shoot it as it comes around, but make sure that you take a few steps to the left as it's going up around you, and then take a few steps to the right when it's off the screen at the bottom so that it doesn't catch you from below. With the Earth Boss out of the way, the Fire Boss will attack you, and I think that he's the most consistent one, so this is when I like to come up towards the top of the mountain and use the Silver Fleece. Now if you come in contact with the elementals, you'll still take damage, but it's going to protect you from the projectiles that the fire elemental is shooting at you. You can definitely take damage from elementals even when they are behind the mountain peak in the background, so you gotta be careful of that. And if you notice that your silver fleece wears off, you wanna use it again. While we're up here, we're trying to attack all three elementals, not just the fire one, and you particularly want to take out the water elemental, 
The water elemental moves very quickly when it's the one fighting you, so ideally you won't have to fight that one when the fire one isn't on the screen. We already took out the wind elemental, and the water elemental should be quick to follow. And then there will only be one left, the fire elemental, which is the easiest of them all. Now you'll notice that the Veil of Slumber doesn't actually slow these guys down, but it does slow them down as they die in the background, which is kind of a fun effect. And you can see it happened again to the fire elemental as well. And that's it! We've done it! We've defeated the four elementals and beaten Iron Sword. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. And don't blink or you might miss it. This is a very short ending. We'll see Malkil turn into a skull and explode. And then we'll receive congratulations from the four animal kings. Malkil is vanquished. We've done it. It's time to roll the credits. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally defeat Malkil and return peace to the land of Sindarin. If it did, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos. Because there will always be more sorcerers that need vanquished. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.